Well, we're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday in the book of James, in the fourth chapter of the book of James. And so I invite you to look there with me if you would. I'm going to just give you quickly a, a, a reminder of what we see in verses 1 through verse 5. We see that, that James chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 uh, speaks forth of, of, of great spiritual unhealth. It should not be characteristic of God's people. We find James is talking there to Jewish Christians and he's telling them of the conflicts that they were experiencing in their lives and in their relationships. And of course the implication is it should not be this way. He talks about their prayer life. He says you're asking for things from God and you're not getting them. And he says the reason that your prayer life is so weak and ineffective is you're asking with the wrong motive. Your motive is not right. Instead, you're, you're asking that you might consume it upon your own selfish desires and ambitions instead of it being for the honor and the glory of God. And so he's talking there about, uh, about a spirituality that is greatly lacking. Greatly lacking. And it's characterized by sin and with a self-centeredness. He talks in uh, verse 5 about how the Holy Spirit who lives within us as God's children he says, the Spirit is greatly longing, He's yearning, He's jealous for the control of your life. You're allowing the flesh to dominate, in other words, and you are allowing your, your life to be focused upon yourself instead of being really given to the Lord so that the Holy Spirit of God can be in charge of your life and, and govern of your life. Then here in verse 6, as we pick up, Today, we find that uh, James says here, but he gives greater grace. God says in his word, this life of sinfulness, this life of, of spiritual dilapidation is not to be your experience. And it doesn't have to be because the grace of God is sufficient to bring about life change. He says your life can really be spiritually healthy. It doesn't have to, to match the description of verses 1 through 5. It can be strong. You can be strong in the Lord. You can be spiritually mature. You can be a, a great benefit and blessing to the kingdom of God. Your, your life doesn't have to be one that's just barely making it through, but it can be very productive for the Lord. And as Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 8, you and I ought to be bearing much fruit. And proving through our life that we are real followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you don't have to just barely make it through in this world. You don't have to just get through as somebody who's just, you know, can't wait to get out of this world and get to heaven because I, 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 I'm just not living well here in this life. You don't have to live that way. Instead, your life can be very fruitful and very productive for the Lord. And God can be greatly honored and glorified through you. Everything about us is to bring honor and glory to the name of our Lord and Savior. And by the grace of God, that can be. In the book of Titus, chapter 2, and verse 11 and 12, the Bible says, For the grace of God, as James talks about, God gives greater grace. Titus 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In other words, it's available to Jew and, and Gentile. The grace of God is available to all ethnicities worldwide. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us, all right, instructing us, guiding us, teaching us that denying ungodliness, the ungodliness that James is talking about here in James chapter 4, the grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, he says, you're you're, you're craving, you're lusting, and you're not able to get because you're, 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 you're after your own passions that are outside the will of God. So denying ungodliness and worldly lust, you should live soberly and righteously, that's right living, and godly in this present world with that perspective of knowing that one day Jesus is coming again, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the Great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the way we're going to be living our life. Godly 
living. Righteous living. Victorious living. God honoring living. That's the way that you and I are to be living. Now I pulled out to you last week that James tells us that the daily experience of this grace that gives us spiritual health is dependent upon our being humble before the Lord. You're not going to be a recipient of the daily graces of God that will make you to, to live a life that is real kingdom of God life. You're not going to be able to live that life that really honors the Lord apart from grace, and you're not going to have grace apart from humility. So we find that James here tells us that God resists the proud those who get grace, but He gives grace to the humble. So the only way you're going to have life change and stop living a verse 1 through 5 life is you've got to humble yourself before God. And in the context of humility, then you will be the recipient of grace. If you look at your life and you say, well, I just don't see God doing much with me. You look at your life and you say, I'm not making spiritual progress. I'm really not growing in the Lord. I, I, I don't see that God is, is using me in the ways that I see that the Bible tells me that God wants to use His children. Then maybe you need to look at your life first and say, am I, God, living a life of humility before you? Because it's that life that gets the grace. It's the life of humility. A child of God, and only a child of God, has real humility before God. That first step has to be knowing Jesus Christ as one Savior and Lord. And in that relationship with God that is real because we are saved, we choose to live in humility before God. And, and in that humility, we find the door slings wide open to us for the graces of God. Our text reveals to us two major things that humility does. And we focused in on the first one last week. Humility submits to God. It tells us here in, in verse 7, therefore submit to God. God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So submit yourself to God. Always when there is submission. Always where there is the expression of submission, there is humility. Always. Not just in our relationship with God, but in any relationship. There cannot be humility that is not demonstrated in submission. Wherever there is humility, there will always be a submissive spirit. A humble spirit is a submissive spirit, submissive especially to the authorities that are over that spirit. And so in our context here in James, our submission, and James uh, clarifies it for us, is a submission to God. In humility, we submit to God. Why? Because we know that we have no right to rule our own life. In humility, you recognize that you don't have the right to rule. And, and in humility, you also recognize that you don't have the ability to rightly govern your life. You don't have the right to do it, and you don't have the ability to do it well. You can't live your life well apart from God's rule. And you don't have the right to rule your life apart from submission to God. Yielding yourself fully unto Him. And so he tells us that we are to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, which is a part of that. There's no way to submit to God and, and, and play with the devil. You don't sit in God's classroom and then when the, the bell rings for recess, go out on the playground and play with the devil. Right? It doesn't work that way. Submission to God rejects Satan and the temptations of sin. There is that surrender of ourselves to the authority of God over us. And then this morning I want to really nail down on 
What else humility does? Humility submits to God and humility pursues God. Humility goes after God. In humility we pursue God's presence in our life. A communion with God in our life. In humility we do that because there is that awareness of our great need for a closeness with God. I, I want to have a closeness with God because He's God. Right? And, and the Bible tells me that I can. And I know from experience that I can. What a privilege it is to know the Lord and to walk with the Lord. And to know that, that God loves me in, in this relationship that I have with Him. And that, that I can have intimacy with Him. That I can talk to God. And that God will hear me. And that He will guide my life. And that God will take care of me. And so, you know, we pursue that relationship with God because of the greatness of who God is. And because of the fact that He loves us. And we love Him back. But here in James, no doubt the humility that is being spoken of here is that we pursue God because we know how desperate our need is for Him moment by moment. You heard the testimony of Beverly this morning. Oh, how fitting. Oh, how fitting. Where would she be, she said, without the Lord? What would her life be without the Lord? She realizes the desperate need of her heart for God moment by moment, day by day. The proud person, the arrogant person that says, you know, I'll tack God on my life a little bit. I'll take God like I take a salad bar. I'll pick and choose what I want. That's arrogance. That's arrogance. That really conveys the idea that I don't really need God. And but Barry was still before us today. He says, I can't, I can't make it without. That's humility. That, that swings wide the door for the grace of God to be real in you. You will never know God until you humbly bow before Him. And you will not know Him day by day apart from humility. Humility cries out to God, Oh, I need you. I desperately need you. And so humility pursues God because we know that we cannot make it without Him. And so we pursue God with repentance because we can't hold on to sin and, and go after God at the same time. And so there's repentance, there's faith. We realize that God can be pursued. There has to be that confidence that we can rely upon God. And so we exercise our faith in the Lord in that. We pursue God in prayer. We pursue God through His Word. You don't know God apart from the truth of His Word. We pursue God in worship. God is pursued by the humble. Notice, notice what is said here in our text in verse 8. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. That's intentional effort, isn't it? The Holy Spirit from the pen of James says, draw near to God. Now let's drop anchor. Let's stop the boat, right? Are you in process of drawing near to God. Are you in pursuit of God in your life? Are you going after God? Or do you just do your religious thing? Do you go after God? Do you, do you pursue a closeness with God? Do you seek to maintain a closeness? And beyond that, are you going after a greater closeness? Are you seeking to develop in your relationship with God? That's what James is talking about here in our text. Doing those things that bring us into a greater intimacy 
with the Lord. And the promise, the wonderful promise here is that when we go after God, God comes after us. Draw near to God. And what does it say? And He will draw near to you. One great scholar of Scripture says this, God is never wanting to us. In other words, we don't have lack of our relationship with God. God is never wanting to us except when we alienate ourselves from Him. And we do that by ignoring Him. We do that by, by focusing on, on things instead of being focused on the Lord. We, we do that by by embracing sin, disobedience, that quenches the Spirit of God, and that stands as a barrier between us and God. The, the, the hand of the Lord is not shortened. The ear of God is not heavy that He cannot hear. But your sins have separated between you and your God. Isaiah 59 says, Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 says, How can two walk together except they be in agreement? God was saying of His people, He says, I can't, I can't be close with you. I can't, I can't be with you in a way where you're going to be blessed by my presence because we don't agree. So God says to the prophet Amos, if you're going to really be with me and know me, you've got to come into agreement with me. Alignment. Rejecting those hindrances and pursuing God. The psalmist said in Psalm 42 in verse 1, as the deer longs for the streams of water. The picture that the psalmist paints for us is a thirsty deer. I don't know the situation of the deer, but for some reason this deer is very, very thirsty. Maybe it's been running on a hot day. Maybe it's been chased by some animal. Maybe, maybe some dogs have been running this deer. The psalmist says, like the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, God. Is that a description of your spiritual experience? Do you long for God? Does your heart yearn for a closeness to God? Are you pursuing God like the thirsty deer would run for the streams of water? The psalmist says, I thirst for God, for the living God. In Psalm 63, verse 1, the psalmist says, God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. I eagerly seek you. I'm pursuing you intentionally. I'm coming after you, God, with my heart. I will not be denied my relationship with you. My communion with you is the treasure of my heart. Knowing you and growing close to you and walking with you through my life here in this world is my priority, he said. Is that where you are this morning? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Of course, this is coming as a quotation from the Old Testament prophet, but the Apostle Paul writes in verse 17, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Come out from sin. Repent of, of, of the worldliness of your life. Do not touch any unclean thing, and I will do what I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. And you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. You see the closeness that he's talking about? He, he's saying, I, I, I will embrace you. I will, I will be like a father to you. You'll be like my children. That's relationship. He's, he's speaking here in, in wonderful, beautiful, relational terms. And he's saying, this is the way it will be. He says, I will walk among you. I will live among you. But only if you pursue me by repenting of sin. And coming out of the things of this world. So there is intentional pursuit of God. And it's 
includes also a rejection of all hindrances. Look at verse 8, the latter part of verse 8. It says, cleanse your hands. That would represent sins that are committed. Cleanse your hands. Your hands are dirty. The works of your life are dirty and foul is your hand, your spiritual hand. So cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts. That's the source of the sin. The hands are the activities of sin, the actions of sin, the committal of sin. And these just purify your heart. The heart. It's out of the heart that the, that the mouth speaks. It's out of the treasure of the heart that the life lives. And so he says, don't only uh, repent of what you have done or what you haven't done that you should have. That's your hands getting clean. He says, but purify your heart. Getting a hand washing is, is not enough. Says, You've got to go to the very core of who you are. Purify your heart, double-minded. The word there, double-minded, is a one word in Greek text. It's a disukos, and the di, those of you who have language backgrounds, you know that that, that, that refers to two, right? And then uh, sukos, that's from suke, which means life or spirit. And what he's saying here is, is Get your heart clean. Don't live a double life. Quit living a double life. Quit holding on to the hand of God and trying to hold on to the hand of the devil. Quit, quit trying to, to live as a, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, but yet at the same time you are embracing and living according to this world. He says you, you, you cleanse your heart. You cleanse your mind. You get right with God. In Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2, Lord, who can dwell in your tent? Who is it, God, that can really live with you and know you? Who is it that, that knows your presence in their life? Who can dwell in your tent? Who can live on your holy mountain? The one who lives honestly, practices righteousness, and acknowledges the truth in his heart. That's the one who can really know you. God. Look at verse 9. Now this really makes for good church growth material. Be miserable. We need to put that out on our, on our sign. Out Be miserable, mourn, and weep. We really do. We say that jokingly, but we really do. You know, the message that is being heralded today in Christendom is, is come, hang out with us, eat, drink, and be merry. Have a good time. God bless you. We're all blessed and highly favored. Right? That's what, that's, I mean, that's, that's, not until you mourn over your sin, you're not. Not until you repent of the sinfulness of your heart and life. You don't know those blessings. The heart that knows the joy of the Lord grieves. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, first. There is no, there is no strength in the joy of the Lord until there is humility and brokenness before God. And then when sin comes into the life of the child of God, the joy is gone. The real peace is vacant until there is repentance. And then when we do repent, when we do confess our sin, God is faithful and God is just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, but you will not really know God and you cannot pursue God tied to the weights of the people. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that as we look unto Jesus and run our race, we are to do what? We are to repent of our sin. We are to get rid of every, every sin and the, and the weights that hold us down and beset us in that pursuit. 
We can't run that race with the Lord. We can't walk with God. We can't know God as long as we're holding on to sin. That's the blatant error. One of the blatant errors in the modern church. Telling people they can have peace and fulfillment and that they can know God and have God as their friend and there is no clarion call for repentance and sin and holiness in life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 or chapter 5 rather than verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn. They're the ones who have come. There must be a mourning over our sin before we know the comfort of forgiveness. There must be mourning with contrition. Now notice with me how James reemphasizes this great truth about humility being the key to the life God intends for us to have. It says here, God resists the proud and He gives grace to the humble. And then He concludes this portion in verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. So it's two bookends. God resists the proud and He gives grace to the humble. He says you don't have to live the way that you're living. You can be changed by the grace of God. God's grace will take care of your sin. The grace of God through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient. And so God, God's grace is available, but God's grace is available to those who will humble themselves before God. Live in humility before God. And James says those who live in humility before God, they do two things. They submit to God. They come under the authority of God. And they say, God, whatever you say is right, I embrace it as right. And God, whatever you say is wrong, I embrace that as being wrong. And I repent and I reject sin in my life. That's the first thing that we do. We, we submit to God and then we pursue God. Draw near to God. And God will draw near. Humility says I have no right to live my life my way. So I submit to God. Humility says I can't make it without God. And so I draw near to God. That's why humility is the door to the daily blessings of the grace of God. Let's stand together now.